I show it where they held it, they find it. <laughs> but uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's much appreciated. You know, the line of, of work that we're in, it's, it's always teamwork. It's not, it's not one person that does it. You know, it's uh, people like Granny Mayer here and uh, Edgar Stetler. You know, we've done many, many, many hours of, of thinking and slogging through the bush and, and then gathering data. And uh, that made it possible. Anyway, I want to talk about uh, the BT magnetic anomaly. Now, this is the, the oldest geophysical enigma we have in, in Southern Africa. Uh, Professor Beatty, that we uh, see over here, he, uh, he was professor of physics at Cape Town University, and he had a, a, a friend at Stellenbosch University, Professor Morrison, and uh, the two of them uh, decided they're going to do a magnetic survey of Southern Africa in the 1890s. Starting in the 1890s, they went right through the Boer War, and in 1909, 19, they, they wrote it up as a, as a, as a paper. Now, uh, this is the, the first page of, the, of that report, which is really the first geophysical publication that we've, we've had in this country. Now, the, uh, the way they presented their data was as uh, ridges and valleys. So they've, uh, they've got the positives, which is a ridge, and they've got negatives, which is a valley. Now, I don't know when somebody decided it should be called the BT anomaly, but I, I, I've got a suspicion it's somebody in, in the geological survey. But anyway, this, this trace here is very close to where we have the maximum of the BT anomaly today. That was the first error made of, the, of the, uh, that part of the country. And you can see from the contours, the, uh, the BT anomaly. And I've drawn in the, uh, the ridges of, of BT. You see, they, this one follows it very nicely and then you have the, the bit over there. The, the guy that uh, asked for it is Barma. He was one of Kraman's assistants. He was actually the guy that did the, the, the actual computation of the magnetic anomalies in the 1930s. Now, uh, Rani and I got involved in, in, uh, in the BT anomaly. Uh, in 1969, April, we went down to the Karoo and we had to run a survey from Beaufort West down to, to Classroom. And it was bloody cold. <laughs> it was, <laughs> you know, in the morning, you put on seven layers of coats and then soon as day you peel them off and then later you start putting them on again. <laughs> and uh, we stayed in a caravan at the, at the, the hotel in Beaufort West. Anyway, the, the, uh, through the years, the CSR did several of these, these lines. Uh, Brian and I were involved in most of them. And uh, the result was that the, uh, the soundings looked like this. You had the, uh, a resistive layer, and then you just went down to very conductive layer. Jan van Seuel wrote a paper on this in 2006. And you can see the conductive layer is the, the white hill formation at, at, at the base of the, of the Eka uh, and, and the Dwyka. In, two, uh, in uh, 1971, the CSR did a, a magnetometer array study, induction study. And the aim was to try and find the, the border between the Carl Power Craton and the Makunatal belt. Of course, we saw nothing. And there was absolutely no difference across that, across that border. The, the thing that we saw was right on the edge of the, of the survey. You know, we could see there's something conductive down here, and this was at uh, Prince Albert Road. We could see that that station was on top of a conductive structure. 
<laughs> like uh, all good geophysicists, we decide to heat the Mohr station. And uh, we got the uh, whole array from the University of Alberta, and we built 26 stations ourselves, and we, we put out this, this array. Um, and on this, you can see the what we call the Southern Cape Conductive Belt that we could outline. And uh, the early survey was, was really just touched it down here. Now, uh, I'm going to show you a profile later on that's uh, from the Caledon River down to East London. <coughs> and I'm going to show you several other profiles across the, the, uh, the structure. Now, this is the induction arrows. And you can see this, it outlines this, this conductive belt as well. This is the, the uh, profile through East London, which is a very nice anomaly. This is the, the vertical field uh, against the, the a normal field, which we took as a, as a field very far away from the, the anomalous structure. This is the, uh, the total field. Uh, uh, normalized to the, to the total. The one thing you, you notice immediately is that the, uh, the Z value is, is too high. And we, we decided early on that this is not a, a pure induction anomaly, it's more a current concentration anomaly where you have large areas that are almost short circuited through this, this feature. Oh, and we could, we could work from, from a equivalent line current model. We could work out that the anomalous structure is at the lowest part of the, of the crust, uh, uh, crust uh, around about the, the boundary with the lithosphere. Now, with the years, the, the data collection improved. And uh, this is an image of the of the BT anomaly uh, in a lot more detail than what we had up to that time. Now, the important things that you should notice is the Makunatal crust. It's got a very typical type uh, signature. And you could see here, you've got a, a negative, which means it's a sudden edge of, of a uh, magnetic structure and uh, over here you have the same on, on the east coast. If you look at the at the BT, because the BT so-called BT anomaly is simply the maximum that uh, people refer to. You'll see in the in the east here you've got the maximum and then you've got the minimum. So you get you've got the whole anomaly. You've got the northern side and the south, southern side uh, of the anomaly. And then if you come down here it's it's Less clear, but it's it's still there. And uh, over here, you see that this uh, there's actually a split in in in, in that uh, in that maximum, uh, which is due to faulting in this point of the of the of the the PT structure. We'll look at that in, in a bit more detail just now. Now, if you just put in the, the negative, the, the, the PT positive, you have uh, this, and that's the, the Southern Cape Conductor belt. Now, the one thing you'll notice is that uh, over here, it's a lot closer to the, to, the, to the edge. Over here, it's further away, and then it's, the, the PT is truncated. It disappears, and uh, it doesn't occur to the west. The first people that tried to model the, uh, the BT anomaly was uh, the Plessis and Thomas from the Geological Survey in 91. They did a, an offshore magnetic survey and uh, they came up with this, this model. It said the top of the anomalous body is about 800 meters below sea level. And uh, it's about uh, it's about 30 uh, kilometers wide. That's off the, the Port St. John's coast in, uh, uh, in the east, which indicates that the, 
the BT anomaly was truncated by the breakup of Gondwana. So it's definitely older than the breakup of Gondwana. It's one, one H beacon that we could find. If we come back again and, and look at uh, not only the, the magnetics at the top, the gravity and the isostatic, there really isn't much that you can, you can see that relates to these structures. You have these uh, isostatic anomaly that really dominates the scene. If we, if we zoom in on, on the, the western end of the, of the BT magnetic anomaly, here you can see the two, you know, the, the positives, the, the one positive and then another positive. And note the, these spots that run across the structure. Uh, and uh, if you bear in mind that uh, the Cape Granite were included in this part of the world, the, uh, you had a lot of uplift, which most probably caused the uplift that led to the truncation of the, of the BT anomalies, the anomalous body. Over here, you can again see the transition from Namakwa, Natal, or Namakwa in this case. You get that strong negative before you go into the, the BT anomaly. So the arguments that the, the Marco Natal crust continues southwards just doesn't hold water if you look at these magnetics. If you, uh, if you map out those linear maps, you can see if we have, and, uh, and compare them to the, to the big faults we have in the in Southern Cape, then uh, you see that they have the big fault, the Kango, the Wooster, Colenso, et cetera, that, uh, that really go across this, this whole part. You can also see that they curve northwards by this intrusion of the, of the granites in this uh, southwestern part. Uh, what's important is this big fault that runs through Fedendal, and that's the one that really truncates the, the BT magnetic body. And if you if you look at uh, this thing, you can see the, the shape of those of those uh, uh, fault lines and, and and dikes that you see there shows that the southern part of the of the continent has moved westward. One of the first uh, models of the of the BT magnetic anomaly was our friend Brad when he was still a researcher. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, 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 uh, the very important thing that you know they show very clearly is that the the, the Namaka uh, crust uh, or lower crust is very magnetic, and you could see it from from the magnetic image. You know, you, you get from the edge, you get this very nice negatives. Now. When uh, Edward and I started looking at uh, the magnetic anomaly, we realized that uh, there's not only this big BT anomaly, if you look at this one, you know, this uh, is a profile through the middle of the, of the BT. You see, there's a, another body underneath it. And we mo could model it with an upper body more. Uh, magnetic and a lower body less magnetic. And uh, we could follow that pattern right through the, the, the entire belt. Then we had a lot of work done by groups from all over the world trying to, to decipher the, the, uh, the BT, like you know, uh, seismic work, this is again, how it et al. and seismic work. Uh, the uh, German group uh, of uh, Uta Wegmann, they actually were the first to, to show that uh, that double peak is most probably a break or a step in the, in the magnetic body. We have uh, then we get a bit at all. Very nice seismic results, but 
very difficult to to see anything on it that, that relates to the to the beating. Then the, the work of Stankovic et al. He combined the, the magnetics uh, to, to, to the non-magnetic reading and, uh, and also the seismics. And the, he came up and said, look, the, the, uh, the BT magnetic anomaly is most probably a resistive feature. And uh, you, can, you can see it very nicely in that, in that diagram. But it was what it wasn't obvious in any of the seismics. And then you have the larger scale stuff, also with Stankovich. What what I noticed is you know this step in the mower here, which uh, looked very suspicious to me, but because you're about 300 kilometers from the from the coastal edge, and uh, yeah, that that type of step. So with all this work. We've, we found that, uh, that the beta magnetic anomaly is older than the breakup of the Land. It's older than the Cape Kourou sedimentation because we couldn't see any intrusion into the sediments. Uh, the two, the BT and the Southern Cape conductive belt are coincident, but they have different sources. Because in the Western edge, the, the magnetic uh, feature disappears, but the conductive feature continues. The, the, the BT magnetic anomaly, we can say, is a sheet like resistor body. The BT magnetic anomaly and the Southern Cape conductor belt borders in the Macman Atoll belt, characterized by 1,000 million year old terminal metamorphism, high temperature, low pressure. So the question was what can we deduce from this information we have? And we, we looked at the regional setting and also similar ge uh, ge geological conditions. Now, the first thing that one needs to notice is that the thousand million year old event in the, the Makwan Atoll happened when we had Rodinia. Not, not a Rodinia with an H, and Rodinia. <laughs> and uh, if you look at it, then, uh, you know, we, we find people always want to want to find connections in South America and and uh, in Antarctica and places like that. But if all this happened in Rodinia and this construction reconstruction is correct, which I <laughs> I, I, I won't watch for, but you know it's one I see. Then the Kalahari was sitting on its own out in uh, in space. So so you won't you most probably won't find it if this is correct. But be that as it might. If we look at the at the the, the setting of the car park right on your 2,500 million year and all this stuff, the the, the Macron Atoll belt with the thousand uh, million year old termination, then people don't know what happened to the south of that. You know what we know that you know the the carp wall. Uh, was the original core, and that the rest were added onto this that feature. But what happened beyond that? Now, in the geology of South Africa, there's a, a chapter on on the on the Macro Natal Belt, and uh, it says, among other things, geophysical evidence for a 25 kilometer, kilometer thick underplate of mantle derived magmatic magmas beneath the Bushman land terrain. Green and Durham 1990 provides a potential heat source to explain the Namaquan metamorphic climates. Such extensive un underplating may have been a catastrophic event triggered by subduction related delamination of the mantle lithospheric field. Hausman et al. 81, Gibson et al. 96, Waters 1990 proposed that the terrain may have occupied an extension of back Arctic environment above and north with the being subduction zone prior to the onset of the Namakan event. So now we have the, the idea of the, the delamination in the, in the Makwa. 
I went and I looked here, where, where do we have similar delaminations in the world? Now, I discovered there are two types of delaminations. There's some that are under compressive conditions like the Himalayas and uh, the Andes, but you have, and, but that won't give you the, the, the low pressure, high temperature type metamorphism. So you have to look at an extension of the tree and the basin range and Sierra Nevada really provide the, the ideal type setting. Now, where does the basin and range in Sierra Nevada, Nevada come from? Now, this is the basin and range. It's really a nice piece of country. You know, that's the Grand Tetons, the background, the Snake River, and right in front, the lady with the yellow is my wife 50 years ago. <laughs> so when, we, when we were touring through that part of the world. Now, this is the basin range. So you can see the range part, and you can see the basin part. Now, if you look at the Western North America, then uh, you have the, the basin range out here. Uh, and uh, over here, you have the St. Andreas Fault. And uh, as you know, the... the uh, okay, well, and, and then you have the subduction, the Cascadian subduction to the north that uh, goes up to uh, past Vancouver. That's at uh, Cape Mendocino. You go from the, the, the St. Andreas to, to a different regime. Now, the, the, uh, the history of, of how St. Andreas uh, uh, appeared is that when you had this, this uh, spreading ridge that was going into a subduction zone, and then you go, you, you cause a, a, a fault. Really, it's a a transform fault initially, and that as you go deeper and deeper, and then this is where you end up today. And it is uh, uh, it is surmised that you know the, the fact that you, you carry this this subduction zone, this the spreading reach into the subduction zone, the the one the down dipping uh, arm will just disappear into into the mantle and really cause the heating of the of the uh, of the mantle underneath. If you go to the northern tip of this uh, subduction zone along the, the west coast of the US, then uh, the researchers found in 1990 that uh, in 1990s that uh, at the subduction zone the mower disappears. There's a, a gap in the mower that uh, they couldn't account for. And it's not, it's not only where you have the, the magma rising to the surface. It's really in this little corner where your uh, crust meets the mantle and you have the subducting plate going downwards. They uh, surmised using the, the seismic data they had that this is a serpentinite wedge that's formed at this at this corner in in the, the structure because you it's going down it's getting warmer it, it uh, the whole slab is getting dehydrated and the water goes into the, the mantle rocks and form a very small percentage of serpentina it's most probably less than one percent They studied this thing and they, they found that it's magnetic. Now this this little this little wedge you have here has got a very strong magnetic signature. They also found that uh, this wedge, this E here, that it, it is uh, conductive. So suddenly we have a, a feature that's conductive, magnetic, that uh, that you can find. Where you've had the, uh, you've had this uh, a spreading ridge absorbed by a subduction zone. And they've done actually done the, the work to, to see what happens to the velocities of, of the rocks if you if you uh, create the one percent serpentinite in it, and you can go for your 
at 200 MPa pressure, you can go from eight, eight uh, kilometer per second to about five, but just with this one, one percent of, uh, from it, when you go from zero to one percent. So that's a, it's a significant change. And that's why they couldn't see the mower because suddenly, you know, the, 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 the velocity below the mower was, was too low. So <clears throat> the, we say, look, then maybe we had this situation in the macro land. They had this subduction zone from the south with a, a spreading ridge in the background here. And you have an oceanic plate in the, in the fore arc. Uh, so if you, in a cartoon style, you can say, now look, you've, you've got this subduction, you have this oceanic crust, which formed in the, in the fore arc. You uh, absorb the, uh, the spreading ridge, form a fault like the San Andreas. And uh, today you will have a feature like this. This piece of oceanic crust is the one here, and that is the thing that causes the, the BT magnetic anomaly because it's, uh, it's oceanic vessels. The, the thing below it is a serpentinized mantle wedge, which will give you another less magnetic feature, but conductive. And uh, that is one, one uh, explanation that, that I can give for, for the BT magnetic anomaly. But I think a lot of, lot of uh, very clever people will have to, to look at it and, and verify and, and, uh, and maybe come up with an alternative. I just hope it doesn't take another 50 years before something, <laughs> <laughs> something come up with that. But uh, uh, things that, that would, would go along with that, if you look at, if you look at these uh, big faults in down here, they could be the remnants of something like the, like the, the San Andreas. And what's interesting is that the, the, uh, both the, the BT magnetic anomaly and the, the uh, Southern Cape conductor belt stops against these, these faults. So they are most probably big cluster faults that were transcurrent faults uh, at the, in the past. And now I just want to show you some of the, the models that uh, mostly Edgar calculated for us. Uh, I mean, we're going to look at A, B, C, and D. And D is the, is the eastern, easternmost point. That's the one right in the west. They're the, the, the what we would call the uh, oceanic basalt is gone. We only see remnants of that, right? This upper mantle wedge. Then, if you go to the part where you have the split in the in the maximum, you you have this oceanic basalt on top, and then the hydrated upper mantle wedge below. And you can see they don't go inside either. Uh, this. This edge here coincides with the northern edge of the Southern Cape Conductor Belt. If you look at the CC, again, you have an upper oceanic basalt, the lower right, right upper mantle wedge. And then the one right in the, in the east, you have oceanic crust and hydrated upper mantle wedge. But the interesting thing is you have a big magnetic anomaly there that uh, if you look at this model, that is most probably also oceanic crust, but it's not underlain by something conductive. It's resistive underneath, but uh, it's got the same magnetic signature. <clears throat> now, this hypothesis explained the, the termination of the subduction and the thousand million year old low pressure, high temperature metamorphic event in the Nakwanatal belt. It, it can explain the beta magnetic anomaly. The Southern Cape conductor anomaly, and why the two anomalous bodies are separate, is, despite being for most of their extent recurring superimposed. Why the BT magnetic anomaly does not continue to the west coast of the continent, but the Southern Cape conductor belt does. Now, as I said, you know, the, these things, 
you, you can't do in isolation. It's a, uh, yeah, a lot of people like Dr. Barnaman, Edgar played the huge role, Jan van Seil was the guy that instigated our original work there, Reini, uh, Ian Goff with, uh, with the magnetic induction work, Mike Marr, as you've seen on that model, Brad Pitts was a big model, Des Barlow was the guy that built some of my equipment, Philip Yishun, who passed away many years ago, Reinhard Wiesen, also an engineer that they helped to build instruments, Saar Lubert, also an engineer, Klaus Tipfer, he went on that first trip with Reini and I to the Karoo. David Koza, we had many discussions about the BT and uh, related subjects. Jürgen Blume, technician, Dries Tivinov, a technician. Then as our field assistants, Elias Domini, Marius Makwat, the Alfred Mopoking. And uh, Remy Alabi is actually a Nigerian. He taught me in, in, in Edmonton how to, to analyze the, the magnetic induction data. Which is a tedious job. Franco Corner, we had many discussions. Kuni de Beer is a geologist that knows that western part of the country very well. He's a distant relative of mine. And Uta Wegman, Oliver Ritter, and Jacek Stankovic made contributions. And I can most probably double this number, but those are the people that will help me in most ways. Thank you.